Hello, dear friends. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Spirit Reports of Life After Life. We're studying Heaven and Hell, the second part of Heaven and Hell, and all the different case studies that Alan Kardec gifted us with. The Spirit Reports of Spirits who fall into different categories, from the happy spirits to the mediocre spirits, the suicide spirits. And right now we are talking about repentant criminals. And last week we were discussing the Castelnaudary case, who was a man who was caught in a house. And in that house, and that was in the 19th century, what happened is he committed two crimes, two murders. And as a result of these two murders and his lack of repentance, he got stuck in that house and haunted it. So people who consecutively tried to move in were experiencing being slapped and funny noises happened. So it was a haunted house that he created. So eventually he was evoked after his excarnation. However, he was never found out by human law. So even though he committed two crimes, he was never convicted. So that's um, a rare, not so rare sometimes, but this is something that can happen here on earth. How can that be? How is it possible that a spirit can commit murders and not be found out, friends? So. We can explain it quite easily because our human laws are not perfect. Our human laws are only as perfect as we are. They are a direct reflection of our knowledge and our moral development. So consequently, they are not foolproof. However, we do have another law and that is God's law. God's laws, on the other hand, are perfect, they're immutable, they don't change. Human laws change. Human laws change with our own changes, with our own inner transformational changes and our change in knowledge. But God's laws are immutable. So where can we find God's laws then? So how can we make sure we are fulfilling God's laws? Well, Alan Kardec asked that question too. And the spirits, the illuminated spirits, gift us with the following answer. That is, God's laws are written in our conscience. Right here, we have them always. We take them with us from lifetime to lifetime. Isn't that fantastic? Now, the only thing is, how can it be that we commit so many crimes and we're making so many mistakes if we carry God's laws within our own selves? Well, that is because we don't tune in, we don't listen. We run over them. Our passions, who are most often unbridled, take rein and allow us not to listen to God's laws, which, by the way, we can also study. We can bring them from our hearts and our conscience into our minds and become cognitive co-creators. We can study them in the Spirit's Book, third part of the Spirit's Book, through a question and answer method God's laws are being beautifully explained. So we can also study them there. So how can we make sure we fulfill God's laws? How can we make sure? Well, it is. it sounds very simple, but actually in everyday life, it's not that simple. But we fulfill most perfectly God's laws by desiring for others what we desire for our own selves. So always looking out for others and using our own desires as a measure. How would we want to be treated? How do we treat ourselves? And that is what we need to give to others. That is true justice. And how is justice defined in the Spirit's book by the Spirits on High? What is justice? Justice is the fulfillment of everybody's rights. Everyone's rights need to be fulfilled. Now, how can we do that? How do we know? What, what, um, what's the word? How can we respect everyone's rights? What determines that? Again, we're going back to the human law 
and God's laws. And of course, we know now that God's laws are much more perfect than our laws. So if we, bottom line, desire for others what we desire for our own selves, we fulfill God's laws. Let us do a therapeutic question before we say hello to our friends who have joined so kindly. Let us ask ourselves, how good are we in fulfilling God's laws? How good are we in really making sure that we only desire for others what we desire for our own selves? And that starts with our thinking, our feelings, our words, our actions. On a scale from zero to 10, where do you think you are? Where am I thinking I am? Let us take that into our meditation and find out where we are and whether there is some space for improvement because this is one very important um, factor in, for our own inner transformation. And now that we have a little more time, we may be spending more time at home wondering what we, can, what we want to do or what we can do with all the time we have. Working on our inner transformation is a beautiful thing. So taking this into our daily prayers and meditation to see whether we can perfect ourselves, even if we're not socially around other people, we can do it mentally. We can do it through social media. We can do it through technology, conference calls, through our prayers, our meditation, our walks in nature. Right, friends? And what we also talked about last time, because we're cutting this case in two, we stopped halfway last time. So we're summarizing what happened last time. We've talked about the laws, but we also talked about obsession because obviously our friend from the Castle Nautery, by the way, Castle Nautery, that's the name of the case, is a region in the south of France. It is near the city of Toulouse, which is north of the Pyrenees. So it's landlocked. It's not on, on the Mediterranean or any beach. It's inside, in south of France, but inside the land. So the Castle Nautery. So our friend became an obsessor. He committed two crimes and he became an obsessor. And we asked ourselves, what, how is that possible? How do we become obsessed? And how do we obsess? Well, the opening, the bioterrain, which is one of those buzzwords we're using these days, we want to make sure that our physical bioterrain does not allow COVID-19 into us, right? So we stay healthy, we stay away from other people, and we keep not only physically healthy, we also keep mentally, emotionally healthy, and we pray, and we're staying very serene and calm. That sets us up for a healthy bioterrain, which makes it much more much harder for a virus or any disease to enter our body. Well, the same is true with our moral health. If our moral health is not in such good shape, we're creating a bioterrain, a moral bioterrain, where we can allow, where we allow obsessors in. Of course, obsessive spirits and us have usually had maybe even several lifetimes of connections and it usually involves lack of forgiveness from the obsessor's side. In other words, we may have done something wrong to the spirit and the spirit is not able to forgive. However, it's also the other way around. We can become obsessors if our moral imperfections allow it and create this bioterrain where we can't forgive with we're harboring resentment and rancor towards other people and as a result we can easily become obsessors ourselves and then we're making ourselves guilty so what is the most um, effective tool to help our own obsessors and obsessors in general. What we learned last time is prayer. Prayer is the single most effective tool. However, invocation, like what happened with this spirit and this obsession meetings are very effective as well. They need to be conducted with kindness so that the spirit has trust and actually respects 
the guiding incarnates um, moral guidance so that the spirit can be helped. But the most effective tool, according to Alan Kardec, in both the spirit's book as well, and actually also the gospel according to spiritism, because what we learned is in the back of the gospel according to spiritism, Alan Kardec in the section of the prayers dedicates one chapter to obsessions and there he tells us that prayer is the most effective tool. So now before we go into the continuation of this case, I want to say say hello to the lovely friends who have joined. Let me see, bifocals. Oh, hi, Carol. So nice to see you, dear friend. Thank you for the honor for joining. And there's Nora Brazil, dear friend. Thank you for coming and being here in Maril de Vega. Thank you. It is so beautiful to have this intercontinental classroom where we can exchange ideas, where we learn new lessons, we can study what the spirits on higher teaching us, and we don't even have to get together physically, right? We feel connected, we feel the love. I see the hearts, beautiful. And then there is Julisia, dear friend, thank you, thank you for joining. And there is Angel Harris. Thank you, Angel, also for joining. And um, there, there are some more, but please say hello and also tell me where you are residing. We are in California, Northern California, and um, linked to two spiritist centers. One is Beseha Spiritual Healing Center, uh, which is in Sacramento, and the other one is Divine Light Spiritist Group in Nevada City, California. All right, friends, let us, we have a lot to cover, so let us keep going. So the next thing that happened after we learned that prayer is so effective, the question was asked, what about paid prayer? So um, the, the um, guiding spirit who is, who is communicating with the castle notary spirit, the guy who, who murdered two people, says, um, yes, but notice that I said to pray, which is important but not to request prayers. Now, why do we think praying is okay, but requesting prayers and paying for them is maybe not so okay? Why would that be? Let us look, let us go to the gospel because the gospel gives us a very good idea about that, why this might not be so good. Page 380, there is a whole chapter that Alan Kardec I think I have a bookmark in here already. It's part of chapter 26, which is give freely what you have received freely. And here we're getting already a hint, right? Give freely what you have received freely. It's a chapter on paid prayers, and I'm not gonna, we're not gonna read the whole chapter, but we recommend to look at it because it's 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 important. It's still a practice that some religions do, as a matter of fact, quite a few. I see sometimes ads online. Um, so where churches take money in order to um, say prayers. So now let's see what Jesus thinks about that. Our master, we know, we can trust him. He knows, he knows better, right? So Jesus said, do not make anyone pay for your prayers. So here we are. We don't almost have to go any further. But now let's see whether we find a few reasons. So here it says, prayer is an act of charity. Charity. Charity does not involve money, right? Unless we give money, we, we donate money to the needy. But for us to pray is an act of charity, and that doesn't usually involve money. So prayer is an act of charity, an impulse of the heart, an impulse of our hearts. To be paid for a prayer addressed to God for someone else is to make oneself a paid intermediary. Prayer in this case is a formula whose length is in proportion to the amount of money it yields. So all of a sudden it becomes a business deal. It's not a matter of charity anymore and it certainly wouldn't come from the heart. God does not sell the benefits he grants. Why then would someone who is not even the benefits distributor and who cannot guarantee their obtainment demand payment for a request that might not be answered? right? doesn't make sense. It's not logical. God cannot make an act of clemency, goodness, or justice that is requested from the divine mercy be dependent on a sum of money. 
God would not do that. God wouldn't make an act of charity, an act of clemency or goodness of justice dependent on the amount of money that was paid. Otherwise, the consequence would be that if the sum were not paid or if it were insufficient, God's clemency, goodness and justice would be withheld. So if the answer, the answering of a prayer was dependent on money, that wouldn't make God just. It wouldn't it wouldn't be a benevolent God. It would be a businessman who says, okay, so Carol, you have more money, you pay more, so you get more. And, um, and Lisa Tellis pays less, so she gets less, right? Hi, dear friend. Hi, Lisa. So nice to have you. This is also Mark. Hi, Mark. So good to have you here, dear friend. So it can't be God is just. He would not make the answering of a prayer dependent on money. Good God's justice is like the sun. Isn't that beautiful? God's justice is like the sun. It is for everybody, for the rich as much as the poor. So we don't have to go any further. There is no space for paid prayer. Um, it wouldn't be effective. Let us go back to our Castel Notary case. So now, if you like to follow along, we're now on page 444, 444 in Heaven and Hell. And we're talking about the Castel Notary case, part two. He's a repentant criminals. criminal. He killed two people and he became an obsessor of a house. He created a haunted house. We had been told that time does not exist for spirits and that to them a century seems like an instant in eternity. Doesn't this apply to all spirits? The answer is no. Indeed, it is the case only with spirits who have reached a very high degree of advancement. For less evolved ones, time is frequently very long, especially when they are suffering. Well, we wanna to go to the spirits book on that. However, we're also reminded of a case we discussed um, a while ago which was um, a double suicide. And um, it was a mother and a, um, a, and a child. And they were roaming around in darkness. They were passionate for food still. They needed, they wanted to drink. They were in darkness and it seemed for them an eternity the suffering so in other words when spirits hanging around closer to us are living closer to earth and are less evolved we're learning that they still have passions to a certain degree the lower their level of involvement in a transformation soul development is the more they are like us because one thing is clear when we excarnate we don't become angels overnight. No, we're still the same spirits. If we're ignorant on this side and not very developed, then we are the same ones when we excarnate. So there are all kinds on the other side. But let's go to the spirits book for a moment because it will flesh it out a little bit more for us. This is chapter six and it's called Perceptions, Sensations and Suffering of Spirits. A whole chapter Alan Kardec dedicated to that. And it's question 238. Where is it? 238. Here we go. And it's part of chapter 6, as we said. So question 238. Are the perceptions and understanding of spirits unlimited? So do spirits have unlimited understanding and perception? In other words, do they know everything? The answer is, the nearer they approach perfection, the more they know. If they are high order spirits, they know much. Low order spirits are more or less ignorant on all subjects. Makes sense, right? Then question 240, he's asking the time question and here he gives a little bit of a different answer, but it's still the same. He just qualifies it in heaven and hell. So do spirits perceive time as we do? And the answer is no. They do not perceive time as we do. And that is what causes you to misunderstand us when it comes to setting dates or epochs. 
obviously they're talking about more evolved spirits and the spirits who answered here are obviously more evolved. So then in the small print, Ellen Kardec explains, spirits live outside of time as we know it. For them, duration of time does not exist, so to speak. The centuries that are so long to us are to them only instants that disappear into eternity. In the same way that the unevenness of the ground would fade and disappear to someone up in space. So higher order spirits, higher order spirits do not perceive time the way we do. But we know that lower order spirits still do. Question 243. Do spirits know the future? And they say again, it depends on how purified they are. Frequently, they may glimpse it, but they do not always have permission to reveal it. So it's a really interesting chapter. You may want to look at it and educate yourselves further because we're just kind of picking and choosing because our time frame isn't big enough to go deeper. But that particular chapter really helps to understand um, how spirits, what they're feeling and what their sense is and what they're thinking and how they go about their life in life after life. All right, let us go back to our Castel Nautery. Where were we? Um, yeah, we talked about the uh, whether they have the same sensation. So our friend, he was punished, but not as severely because he was more ignorant and did not understand the full range of his crime. Okay, here we have to back up. Sorry. Where did the spirit come from before his incarnation? So the Castel Nautery spirit, where did he come from? And now this is interesting. He lived among the fiercest and most savage tribes before that. He lived on a planet less advanced than the earth. Wow, that's interesting, right? So we're here encountering a spirit who before he incarnated on earth did not live on earth. He came from a less evolved planet than earth, even less evolved. Next question, this spirit is being severely punished for the crimes he committed. Now we know that there is no punishment. Right? So we're clear on that. It is always the law of action and reaction. It's the law of cause and effect. There is no punishing God. So we'll just say it over and over again because this book was translated during a time when that word was still used. But now we know that there is no such thing as punishment. It is just the law of cause and effect. If I spill the milk, I have to clean it up. That's not my punishment, but that's because I spilled the milk, right? So it's very simple. So the spirit is being severely punished for the crimes he committed. If he had lived among cruel tribes, he must have committed acts that were no less atrocious than the last ones. Wasn't he also punished for them? Very valid question. So if he lived in a lesser developed planet, and he must, then he must have committed equal or even worse crimes. So wasn't he punished for them? Well, the answer is he was punished, but not as severely because he was more ignorant and did not understand the full range of his crimes at the time. Let us pause. This is interesting. So when we're less, when we're more ignorant, we, our effect is less severe. Interesting. How can that be? Well, as we hear, as we learn here, it is related to our level of knowledge, our level of inner transformation. The more we know, the more accountable we will be held. Now let us go back to our trusty spirits book. Question 636. Another super good and important um, chapter. It's chapter two, the law of worship. Uh, no, that's the wrong one, 636. Sorry about that, guys. I twisted the number. It's actually chapter one, divine and natural laws are good and evil absolute for everybody? Now that is a very good question. Are good and evil absolute for everybody? What do you think? Well, God's law is the same for everybody, but evil especially depends on the willingness one has for doing it. Good is always good and evil is always evil, whatever a person's position may be. The difference is in the degree of responsibility. So God's laws are immutable and they apply to everyone equally. However, the measurement of good and evil 
Good is always good and evil is always evil. But how is it being accounted for in each and every single person or spirit in this universe depends on our level of knowledge, both intellectual as well as our soul knowledge, our moral, our moral knowledge, our moral development. So the more we know, the more guilty we are. So if I know very well that cutting someone off in traffic is not the way to go, and I still do it, and I still do it, and I still do it, I'm more guilty than someone who doesn't even know that that's the law, that we can't do that, right? So let's go to question 637. 600. Are cannibals who yield to their instinct guilty when they eat human flesh? Are cannibals being held accountable? The answer is, I have said that evil depends on the will. Well then, persons are guiltier the more they know what they should do. So if the tribe is still not developed enough, they are not being held as accountable for eating their friends and family members as we would because we are at a very different level. So this is really, really important for us. The more we study spiritism, the more we know. It's beautiful and we're so grateful, but we also need to be aware of the fact that we will be held more accountable because we know more. So then in question 642, Alan Kardec is wondering, so what happens if we, is it good enough that we simply then do not do evil, act ignorantly. Is that good enough? And then the bar is being raised a little bit higher. I always have the picture of the high jump. Remember that it's like a sports um, activity. You can long jump or high jump. And we used to have to do that when we were kids with these sticks. I don't know the terminology. But you know, every time you go over a bar, <clears throat> They raise it a little bit more and here the spirits are raising the bar for us even further. They're saying, no, it's not just good enough to not do evil, but we're even held accountable for all the good we omitted uh, in doing. So we're accountable for all evil that results from all the good we left undone. I say it again. We are also responsible for all the evil that resulted from us omitting doing the good. So it's not just good enough to not do evil. So we have to do the good, do the good, do the good, do the good. As Vanessa, our dear friend Vanessa always says, do the good, do the good, do the good, do the good. Yes, we need to see goodness and we need to visualize goodness. We need to feel goodness and mold it with all the resources we can muster. And that is a full-time job. Always seeking, doing, fulfilling visualizing goodness lens so let us move on and the other thing is we all can do good how is that well sunshine i'm lying in the hospital i'm very sick how can i do the good uh, or sunshine the coronavirus i can't leave my house so how can i do the good when i'm just walking around and from living room to bedroom to bathroom and kitchen how can i do the good there well, we have prayer, we have visualizations, we have our thoughts, we can practice having positive, loving and kind thoughts all day long, which will ripple out and help the whole planet in, in their healing. We can pray as a charitable act and connect with God and bringing in the light. We can pray for other people, we can pray for our obsessors, we can pray for all the suicide. Um, spirits, which the Leon Denis asked us to do in the preface of Memoirs of a Suicide by Yvonne Pereira. He says that we need to daily, we should pray for suicide spirits because they're often the for forgotten spirits. So we could be busy all day long praying. And that doesn't mean that we need to sit in a chair and just pray like this all day long. No, Emmanuel teaches us that any concentration any mental focus is a form of prayer. So if we focus our minds on connecting with God and Jesus and Mother Mary and the good spirits and, our, and communicating with our mentors, that's all while we wash the dishes, clean the house, go into the yard, prepare for spring, take a walk, 
go jogging, all those things can involve prayer. So we can always do the good. So let us go back to our case, shall we? Um, so is the situation in which the spirit now finds himself that of those commonly called the damned? So is he called a damned spirit? They want to know. And the answer is absolutely not. For there are spirits who are in an even more dreadful situation than he is. Suffering is far from being the same for everybody, even for similar crimes. It varies according to how accessible the guilty spirit is to repentance. And this is really important. I really want to underline that in a minute. We're going to talk about it more. But this sentence is vital. So it varies. So suffering varies according to how accessible the guilty spirit is to repentance. Why repentance? We'll look at that in a moment. For this particular spirit, the house where he committed his crimes is his hell. Others contain their own hell within themselves. Unappeasable passions torment them. So before we go into repentance, we want to look at hell, the concept of hell. Well, in the spirits book again, at the very end, Ellen Kardec dedicates a chapter to um, future joys and sorrows. And he talks about, he has a sub-chapter in that, and that's called Heaven, Hell, and Purgatory. Warmly recommend it, right here at the end, whole chapter on Heaven, Hell, and Purgatory. We know what the traditional religions teach us about it. And of course, in Heaven and Hell, the book Heaven and Hell, Alan Kardec demystifies those terms and those beliefs. But then he also goes into it a little bit more here in the Spirits book at the end. And we're looking at question 1012. We're high up there. And the question is, are there circumscribed places in the universe that are intended for the punishment and pleasures of spirits according to their merits? So do we have places that are called hell and the spirits, they go there, have either no merits, low merits, or a lot of merits, and then they don't go there. Question, good question. And the answer is, we have already responded to this question earlier in the book. Punishments and joys, and we know effects and joys of causes and joys are inherent to the degree of a spirit's perfection. Each spirit carries within itself the source of its own happiness or unhappiness. I say that again, because that's very important right now, where we may not be able to indulge in what we used to indulge in. Each spirit carries within itself the source of its own happiness or unhappiness. And since spirits are everywhere, there is no circumscribed or enclosed place for one or the other, heaven or hell. So since we carry our own hell or heaven within our own selves, and that depends on what? On our thinking and our feeling. Depends where I put the lens of my mind onto. If I focus on the mud puddle and I can't look beyond it and all I see is a mud puddle, I will definitely, as I think I emit and then attract, attract more mud puddles in my life. But if my mind, the mirror of my mind connects with God and brings in the sunlight into my home, in my life, into my thinking, into my heart, I create more sunlight. Right, friends? So it is in our own power. Right now, we, will, we are practicing social distancing. We're in our quarantine. We can call, make it a quarantine of love, or we can make it a quarantine of terror and panic and fear. It's our choice. And every night, we have the beautiful opportunity to study serenity, with our dear teacher, Dr. Vanessa Anzalone, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we have the beautiful 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have the beautiful prayers. So there's so much online that we can do. We can listen to Kardec Radio. We can subscribe to, to apps that give us positive affirmations. And it's our choice. We carry heaven and hell inside our own selves and consequently in the cosmos there is no such place where there is hell and we're stuck in there. It does not exist. The small print of this answer is 
The idea of fixed places of reward and punishment exists only in people's imaginations. It proceeds from their tendency to materialize and circumscribe things whose infinite nature they cannot comprehend, right? It's so vast, then we get all, like with this virus, we don't know what's going on. So we get all fickle and we get all panicky and then we try to bring it in. And so it's good to be peaceful and have faith. We don't need to put things into a box where it doesn't need to go into a box. And certainly not when it comes to health because it doesn't exist in that sense. There is no circumscribed place in the universe. So now let us continue. There's still a few more things to cover here. I hope you're still with me. Rita de Cassia, Gabrielle Inacio, dear friends, it's so lovely to have you. So happy to have everyone say hello and what an honor. Thank you for studying with me. It's so much easier to do it in a group, right? Than being alone. So notwithstanding his low advancement, so the spirit's low advancement, this spirit is sensitive to the effects of prayer. We have seen this to be equally true in other perverse spirits of a more brutal nature. So, so they're wondering, so how is it possible that more enlightened spirits whose intelligence is more developed show a complete lack of good sentiments? And then those who scoff at everything most sacred in other words, those whom nothing affects and who never give cynicism a rest. And so how can it be that those... <coughs> Sorry, I'm for the dog. How can it be that spirits who are more super intelligent are so hardened and closed off to prayer or anything, any connection to the divine? But then our friend, who is obviously a more savage spirit, who is not evolved and not educated, is sensitive to prayer. And Alan Kardec and the spirits here are wondering, the incarnates are wondering, how can that be? Now let's look at that. Interesting, right? The answer is prayer is, profit, is profitable only for the spirit who repents. So our friend was open to the prayer because he already started the process of repentance. So this is the key difference. No matter how evolved and how matter how intelligent we are, if we have not, we're not starting at least the process of repentance, we're not open. We're not open to prayer. We're not ready to be helped. Let's continue. We're going to go into that further. For those who out of pride revolt against God and persist in error by exacerbating it, Prayer can do nothing, nor will it do anything until one day a spark of repentance begins to manifest in them. The ineffectiveness of prayer is yet another punishment for them. That's kind of like their own hell that they're creating. Prayer relieves only those who are not completely hardened. So this is very, very interesting. And we have it confirmed in, in different books that in order to be ready to be helped, in order to be ready to receive the benefits of prayer, we need to repent. Why is that? We find the penal code in the first half of Heaven and Hell explained in, at length. And again, we, the proposal is to go there and educate ourselves. But in lieu of doing that, full-fledgedly, we'll just summarize. And we've done it before, but effort and repetition cannot, is not, can never do dam damage, right? So in order for us to regenerate, which is our, our path through the many incarnations we go through, because we've all committing crime, have committed crimes and are doing wrong things, right? So, but we have always the opportunity to regenerate ourselves. There's three steps that are necessary for our regeneration. And the first one is always repentance. First step is repentance. It softens our hearts, but it has to be sincere repentance. It has to come, it has to be the soul, this heart opening. And if it's just fake, it doesn't work. It has to be sincere repentance. 
and it softens the heart and it awakens hope. We had a case, her name was Lisbeth in Heaven and Hell several months ago and she was on page 355. We're just gonna quickly zoom there, 355. We had studied that already. And what we learned here is repentance is useless when it is but the result of suffering. Effective repentance must be based on the regret of having offended God and on ardent on an ardent desire to make reparations. So effective repentance is based on sincere regret of having offended God. We sometimes find the word remorse in the literature. And when we go to the Bible and we, we listen, we find the section where Paul educates us on the difference of remorse and repentance. We said it a few months ago and I forget in what part of the Bible, but I can look it up if you're interested. If you wanna know, please leave me a note and I will give you the exact section. Paul said remorse is a more worldly regret. Like if I eat all the cookies in the cookie jar and then I sit there bloated and, and I don't feel good in the evening, I feel remorse, I should have not done that. However, repentance is something bigger. It's like a crime. It is something where we talk to God. It is feeling regret before God. It is knowing that we have done wrong before God. The cookies, not so much, but that's what repentance is. Then we learn sometimes suffering brings about a less than sincere cry of repentance. So it has to be sincere. Repentance does not always result in the immediate liberation of a spirit, however, but it predisposes it to liberation. So that's the opening of the heart. So then what happens? What is the next step? Next step is expiation. And expiation is the physical and mental suffering that we can experience either in our current lives in life after life, in our spirit life, or in our new incarnation. And repentance, true repentance, opens us up to receive that help, that insight. We are reminded of Nosola. When André Louise was in the umbral, eventually, he fervently prayed. He felt repentance, remorse for his life. And at that very instant, the helper spirits from Nosolar came and rescued him, right? Do you remember, friends? The same we see in memoirs of suicide, where there's actually a section that's beautiful. I think I have it marked right here. Memoirs of a, of a suicide by Yvonne per Pereira. There's a section where the suicide cases are in the valley of suicide suffering tremendously and there is a section when they said um, whenever a benevolent soul whether one of our family members or even someone unknown to us sent vibration fraternal vibrations through the immensity of space to our heavenly father asking for mercy for our despair darkened souls we would be immediately informed by a light on the device they had like electronic devices which in addition to transmitting the kind words of the prayer also reproduced the images of those praying. So the minute the soul in the valley of suicide would have these feelings of mercy and um, repentance, even if it's just a spark, the help of spirits, they, a light would go off and they would recognize and that was through prayers too from the outside so that's where we see the effectiveness of prayers they would be rescued so repentance sets us up for our next step it opens us to hope and then the next step is expiation so during our life after life during the spirit life and we learned that in memoirs of a suicide in a very detailed format the spirits go through a lot of re-education a lot of education to understand about their situation and to become a little more wise. But eventually every spirit wants to be reincarnated. And so expiation is a very, very common occurrence in uh, a new life, a new incarnation. 
And then the third step is reparation. So reparation is righting a wrong. It is fulfilling the duties that we did not fulfill in a previous incarnation. So reparation can happen in this lifetime. If we've wronged someone, we can seek them out, hopefully, and make up for it now so we don't have to do it later. But it can also happen in a new life. And so if we have not fulfilled our duties in a previous incarnation, they will catch up with us. Um, and then they become regenerative duties in the form of an ugly boss or a difficult wife or husband or child and so forth. So now we know the three steps, repentance, expiation and reparation. And that gets us to our regeneration. Those are the, the steps to our regeneration over and over again. But the first one is repentance. And we learn that without a spirit feeling some repentance, Prayers are not really reaching them. If one perceives that a spirit is inaccessible to the benefits of prayer, is that a reason not to pray for it? Very good question, because we're wondering about it too. So then Sunshine and, and Leon, Dini, why are you all telling us we need to pray for suicide spirits and we need to pray for our obsessors and we need to pray, 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 right? If they're not open to it and here's the answer is that a reason not to pray for them certainly not for sooner or later prayer could triumph over its hard heartedness and enable good thoughts to germinate in it so it's like drip irrigation here on the west coast it's always dry so in our gardens we have drip irrigation which is like lines that go through the bed and there's always drip 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 so when we, in the middle of summer, if we didn't use drip irrigation, the ground gets rock hard to the point that you need to use some really strong tools down to a sledgehammer. That's how dry the ground gets. But we soften the ground before we open it up through drip irrigation every day, drip, drip, drip. And that's what these prayers, these prayers, they float towards all these souls, those spirits, and to soften, the ground and the minute they feel repentance and they open up there it is it's beautiful a beautiful process so there is never a moment where prayer is wrong it does not exist it is the same with certain illnesses the effects of medications take time and cannot be determined immediately with others however the effect is immediate if one is convinced of the truth that all spirits are perfectible and that none are fatalistically and eternally destined to evil one understands that sooner or later, prayer will have an effect on them. So let us keep praying. So then, during your long isolation, the spirit is now being asked, and one might even say captivity, did you feel any remorse? Now let's listen. The answer is not the least. So our haunted, haunting spirit says he did not feel any remorse. During his time, he was caught in the house. And that's why he was caught in the house. And that's why I suffered for so long. In the world of spirits, this is the explanation in the small print. In the world of spirits, if there are rewards for every virtue, there are also punishments for every wrong. And we know that's just the law of cause and effect. And the wrongs that escaped human laws are always reached by the laws of God. We should also point out that equal wrongs Though committed in identical circumstances, may be consequenced quite differently, depending on the spirit's level of intellectual development. So the effect of painful causes, of crimes, of omissions, of doing the wrong, the effects look differently in every single case and in every single spirit. The lower, lowest order spirits have a, more, have a brutal nature, like the one who have just concerned we have just concerned ourselves with like the spirit we're studying they are inflicted with punishments that are to some extent more physical than mental while the opposite applies to those whose intelligence and sensitivity are more developed so if we commit a crime and we're more evolved and more intelligent our effect our consequence will look very different from the same crime being committed by a more brutish spirit, less evolved spirit, like this Castelnaudary spirit.
Okay, so this is interesting to know. So somebody who commits suicide, the, the consequences they will have to experience will be different from suicide case to suicide case. And the same with murder. It doesn't matter what crime. Every single one is different and specific to our level of evolution. It was only when I began, so this is the spirit speaking again, it was only when I began to feel remorse that unbeknownst to me, the circumstances appeared that led to my evocation, an incident to which I owe the beginning of my deliverance. So thank you for taking pity on me and for enlightening me. So see, the moment he felt remorse, that's how it started, and then repentance before God. But he was not some a spirit who would believe in God at that point. But he felt some remorse, and already right there, he was allowed to be evoked, and the evocation created this whole avalanche of next steps. It opened him up. He felt hope, and we will learn that. Or maybe I skipped over that, but he was allowed to leave the house. And when he first was evoked, he wore a blood trenched shirt. He was wild looking, he had a dagger in his hand. And as a result of the conversations with him during the evocation, and which was initiated by his repentance, his feelings of remorse, he was able to drop that bloody shirt and the dagger. So that was the beginning of his recuperation, his regeneration. So in the, divine, in the divine penal code, the wisdom, goodness, and foresight of God towards God's creatures are revealed even in the smallest things. How beautiful. Everything is proportioned and combined with admirable solicitude in order to facilitate the means of rehabilitation. Their soul's smallest good aspirations are taken into consideration. So it is the, the divine, it's the divine wisdom, goodness, and foresight of God towards his creatures that is revealed in the smallest things. So whatever the cause of our suffering, the effect will be different, that we will need the reaction will be different that we will need to experience because we are all different children of the same God. And that is the same right now with the coronavirus. We're all experiencing a certain amount of captivity and yet our own, as we're receiving the same kind of treatment, however, for each and every single different soul here on planet Earth, this captivity will take a different form. This quarantine will have a different flavor because we're all different and we're all at different levels of our evolution. And God will look out for us. He has, as dear Carol Correa always says, he has his tiny little baby monitor with us. I love that so much, Carol. And he's observing us and seeing what we need what we need in every single situation. It's all tailor-made. It's all tailored to our situation. Same with when we get sick. And this is why Western medicine, allopathic medicine so often fails because there's one illness, cancer, and there is the same method of treating the cancers. But we all get different, get sick of cancer, let's say, for different reasons. Because we, we are different souls. We have different history. We have different um, crimes we've committed, different wrongs we've done. And then we develop, yes, we develop the same disease, but the path to our sickness is different. Consequently, the path of healing needs to be different too. Yes, and I'm speaking out of experience. So it's really, it's really true. And let us continue. So the soul's smallest good aspirations are immediately taken into consideration. And that applies to us too. So our good aspirations are all taken into consideration. So we don't need to look to be glorified or being told we've done good. No, we don't need that at all. God knows. And that's what's important. 
We asked what would happen to the spirit if he could not have been evoked. And what happened to all the other suffering spirits who cannot be evoked? Very good question, right? This spirit was fortunate and he was evoked and that helped him. But not every spirit gets evoked. So then what? So what happens to those we do not even know about? We received the answer that God was innumerable that God has innumerable means for saving such creatures. Evocation, evocation is one means of helping them, but it certainly is not the only one. And that God forsakes no one. God forsakes no one. God does not forsake us right now on planet Earth with a little virus that's taking its turn here. It's wreaking havoc. God is not forsaking us. God is looking out for us. All we need to do is love. <laughs> All we need to do is love. I'm not a singer. I'm not even going to try to pretend. But that's what just came to mind. All we need to do is love. And we do it through prayer. We do it through visualization. We do it through helping our neighbors. We do it through social media, posting positive things. There's so much. We can make a list. We can make two lists. How does, what good does the coronavirus do? And how can I do the good? That's God's to-do list when we wake up in the morning. Now that we have so much time to ourselves, how can I do the good while I am at home? And how does this virus serve me? That's another list. It's also a positive list and the two lists may even be linked. So, thus, collective prayers should exert their share of influence over all spirits who are collective prayers, who are susceptible to repentance. Collective prayers, we're doing it thanks to the spirit mentors and our dear friend Vanessa. We're doing the prayers every day at 6 p.m. Eastern time, right? And there's other sides. I saw that, the, that there's other, um, I forgot now what they were called, but there's so many different um, collective prayer initiatives right now that we can join if we don't want to pray on our own. So let us wrap up. God cannot make the fate of suffering spirits depend on the goodwill and understanding of humans. No. Ever since human beings were able to establish regular connections with the invisible world, one of the primary aims of spiritism has been to teach adherents the service they can render to their discarnate brothers and sisters through connections like prayer. In this way, God willed to show them the solidarity that exists among all beings in the universe and to pro provide a law of nature as the basis for the principle of fraternity. By both opening up this new field for the exercise of charity. Dear friends, what a beautiful note to, to um, end on. What have we learned today? We have learned that prayer, may it be our own prayer, collective prayer, is a concentration of our minds. We can do it all day long as long as we connect with the higher realms those are divine prayers we don't want to indulge in infernal prayers in Infer an infernal prayer would be fear and panic and going and reading all the news on the virus no we are having faith we're connecting with god we know we're never forsaken god divine providence looks out for us so we're in good hands our father is the pilot. Our mother, father, our parent is the pilot. We don't have to worry. So praying, we're going to pray more. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for patience. We're going to pray for resignation. We're going to pray for courage. We're going to pray for serenity. We're going to pray for forgiveness. While we're cooped up, we can practice, we can make another list, friends. We can make a list of all those people we want to forgive to, for, who we want to forgive. Very important list. Because God said, Jesus said, forgive 70 times 7 before you pray. It is the 
It is the gift most pleasing to God. We need to forgive so we can pray for forgiveness and practice it. Understanding the mechanisms and now that we have more time, making that list and then going down the list person by person and working on that through prayer, visualization and maybe reaching out to them. And then we can pray. It was last Wednesday at Divine Light. The mentors came through and said, Dear friends, pray while we are indulging in our quarantine of love, let us focus on the love. Let us pray for our obsessors too. And let us pray for all the spirits who are suffering. Let us pray for all the criminals, the repentant criminals, the non-repentant criminals. And let us never forget to pray for the suicide spirits. Dear friends, for the week to come, let us focus on prayer. And always remember that prayer is the concentration of our mind, as Emmanuel explains it to us. It is our, the um, mirror of our mind is turning towards God. We're focusing on the higher realms with good thoughts, which is what this planet needs for its healing. So that the little coronavirus can go back to where it came from. Dear friends, thank you so much for joining. So God willing, we will resume our study with a new case next week, same time, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, here on Cardiac Radio. Thank you, all mentors. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, all spirits. God bless you. Good night.